This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. My guest is Joni Mitchell. Since the late 60s, she's been one of the most influential singer-songwriters in popular music. She hasn't been writing, recording, or performing for the past few years. Instead, she's been reviewing her body of work and putting together new compilations. Two have recently been released. Dreamland is a retrospective spanning her entire career, including such well-known songs as The Circle Game, Both Sides Now, Carrie, and Big Yellow Taxi. Her CD, The Beginning of Survival, collects 16 songs from the 80s and 90s. She says this represents some of her strongest work, although these songs never became as popular as her earlier ones. Let's start with a song from The Beginning of Survival called The Magdalene Laundries. These are the laundries run by strict nuns to which young Irish women were sent, where they became virtual prisoners. They were sent because they were unwed and pregnant, had been raped, or were considered too flirtatious. I asked Joni Mitchell how she wrote the song. Well, at, at, the, at the time I wrote the Magdalene Laundries, it was still a very touchy subject in Ireland. I, I did an international concert in Japan and, uh, you know, various rock and roll groups and so on. And we were we were all required to team up and interact in certain ways. And so I performed the song with the chieftains, who were very nervous. And the Irish press was all over me about this this song at that time. And I think things have opened up and changed since then. Um, I'm, I'm sure that most of these laundries are closed, but there were still some of them operative as late as the 90s, I believe. Um, the the thing that sparked the song was my my uh, I have a, a a property in Canada by the ocean and I have a caretaker there who who is a, a Dane and and uh, he said to me one day you know Joni he said you're a basically cheerful person but you write these melancholy songs I think it's because you stay up late at night you should write something during the day so I went out on the point and I came up with that music for the Magdalene Laundries which sounds very much like the spot that it was created in, and water and birds and so on. Then I went in to get some groceries, and I bought a newspaper. I came back, and on the front page of the newspaper, there was an article about um, the sisters in a, in a Magdalene Laundries in Dublin selling off an acreage to realtors, and while they were grading to build something on it, they unearthed over 100 unmarked graves, women's graves marked Magdalene of the Tears, Magdalene of the Sorrows. So they had gone, Catholic girls too, unconsecrated into the ground without even their names on them. So then I, I, I you, you know, um, well, I wrote the song with a lot of empathy and, and um, to a degree, imagination from just a little bit that was mentioned about them in this newspaper article. Well, let's hear this song, The Magdalene Laundries, uh, written by, written and performed by Joni Mitchell and featured on her new compilation, The Beginning of Survival. I was an unmarried girl I'd just turned 27 When they sent me to the sisters For the way men looked at me Joni Mitchell recorded in 1994, and that song is featured on her new compilation, The Beginning of Survival. Now, my understanding is that you're not writing or performing now, that you're on no. a hiatus from writing and performing. Do, do you miss it? I mean, like, are you, are you singing at home even though you're not performing on stage? No, I can think of nothing to raise my voice in song to at this particular time. I don't want to write social criticism. Uh, I don't want to write angry songs. Um, I'm waiting for something to happen, I guess, within me. Um, I've said, and I think there's an element of truth, or maybe it's very true, that that I wrote songs from the time that I lost my daughter until the time she came back. 
And since my family has returned to me, I don't write anymore. It seemed like I mothered the world until I, I got my own family to, you know, mother or befriend. <laughs> Can we explain what you mean by that? When in 1964, you were pregnant out of wedlock, and um, uh, and and you, uh, I guess this would have been a big scandal at the time. Yes, it, it was in uh, 1965. I I gave birth to uh, a, a girl. The 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 traditional way of dealing with it in those days was the child would be taken away, and you didn't you didn't see her, and and that made it and and placed. Um, up for adoption. But in 1965, uh, in in the city of Toronto, girls came from just about every city in Canada to give birth to these children in the anonymity of the city. You know, it was the year before the pill was available, but the movies had gotten very sexy. So there there, there was a moral shift, you know, that was taking place. And Toronto, uh, there there were more babies than there were adoptive parents available at that time. The only thing I'm saying, the only thing that need be said about this is that having time on my hands since since my child was taken away from me, for the 33 years that my child was taken away from me, I concerned myself with the society in which she was in, which was getting sicker and sicker and more delusional by the day. You know, I was still viewing, you're supposed to start your family and, and secure your family and your faith or whatever your, the backbone of your family life is. And then if you have the energy left over from your family, you stretch out into the community, you know. And, and so I had no family at my nucleus, and I just stretched out into the community. You know, it concerned me the, the direction morally that America, especially as a leader, of the free world was taking, and especially within the context of my industry, you know, the way in the name of rock and roll, bravado, rebellion, I mean, rock and roll when I was a teenager was a bit naughty, you know, but naughty and nice, you know, and it was still swinging, so it still had joy in it, but as it went from being a black innovation, which had a lot of joy in it, to being a white innovation, which had a lot of the only thing that white people knew about rhythmically was war and funerals. So rock and roll, the beat became more warring and more funereal, and the presentation of the female image in rock and roll became more hostile and aggressive, you know, and and uh, and ultimately explicit whoring, which, which is what happened, you know, in more recent times, you know, out and out pornography uh, for preteeners. Finally, I found myself in a musical culture that I could not relate to at all. At the same time, my daughter came back to me, and the whole communication that I was making was kind of to the world that she was in. Now, now my family was was back, and I just stopped writing. It just happened that whatever made me write was just something I did while my family was away. Right. You have two new compilations now, and your compilation, Dreamland, kind of collects songs that, that span a good deal of your career. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you think your voice has changed in the years that you've performed. Um, you used to sing a lot in a, in a high kind of falsetto voice, and then your voice really deepened. Part of that was age, Probably part of that was cigarettes. You know, one of the songs on um, on the new CD, Dreamland, is a, a fairly recent version. I think it's from 2000, of um, of both sides now. So I thought it would be interesting to hear that orchestral version from 2000. You have a full orchestra behind you, back to back with the original version, and and hear not only how your voice changed, but also how you interpret the song differently. It's I think um, it's a, a darker song. It's a slower song, and but here's the when, other when you thing. sing it later, and you've also changed some of the melody around. You're, you're kind of almost like improvising within the melody in the 2000 version. But here's the other thing. It's like I have a, you know, Wayne Shorter comes in and plays with me. He's got, he's got a tenor and he's got an alto horn, uh-huh. and depending on the piece of music, he uses the tenor or he uses the alto horn. So, I mean. A lot of the very high end is gone. It's just gone. That that happens with opera singers that don't smoke over 50. Opera singers sometimes 
retire, but I do have this rich alto voice, which is, is unharmed. You know, I'll never be able to trade guitar licks, you, you know, to, to mimic a guitar again. That's a, a way up in the stratosphere like that. But still, you know, um, I mean, a lot of people didn't, didn't like that little squeaky girl on helium anyway. I mean, it does sound very... Uh, it, it's very suitable for ingenue roles, but I think that the alto horn, if I may use that terminology, mm-hmm. you, you know, brings a different perspective to some of these songs that I frankly like better, and so do many other people. But the press continues to put up this lament about, oh, you know, she's ruined, she's ruined her voice with her bad habit, you know, her stinking habit, you know. So finally I just got, basically I got fed up with facing the ignorance of the press because, you know, I thought that's that's the part really, if truth be known. Every time I had to go to do press, I would, I would have these reoccurring dreams, always with a variation. But basically what it was is that I was in a public toilet and a lot of rude people came in, you know, and I go, oh, yeah, I'm about to do press. So that's basically what it is, you know, being treated like a hostile witness, you know, n- not... It's a fixed fight, having anything intelligent you said snipped up into these dreary little sound bites, and then you you say you hear people say, "Oh, they do press very well, but when you when you listen to what they're saying, they're not saying anything, you know, like so if you're trying to say something, they won't let you. They chop it all up. Uh, you make a balanced statement, they cut it in half, you know, so mainly um, lest I feel. Um, I just felt like I was taking a dive all the time, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like I was being forced to take a dive, well, well, especially in print, well, not so much in, on, on, on the air. You got a better shot at finishing your sentence. <laughs> right. Unless I interrupt, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, Sorry. no, we, we do in dialogue. I mean, yeah, it should be dialogue, not monologue. Um, but wh- why don't we hear these two versions of both sides now back to back? Just because I think it's, it's really interesting to compare what you do with the song. Uh, both times. So, so why don't we give that a listen? Okay. Rose and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air and feather canyons everywhere. Looked at clouds that we but now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. I've looked at clouds. Of angel hair And ice cream castles in the air And feather canyons everywhere Looked at clouds that way But now they only block the sun They rain and they snow on everyone So many things I would have done But clouds got in my way I've looked at clouds from both sides now From up and down Still somehow It's cloud illusions I recall I really don't know clouds At all 
That's Joni Mitchell. We heard the original version of Both Sides Now and the 2000 version, which is included on her new anthology, Dreamland. We'll talk more with Mitchell after a break. This is Fresh Air. Let's get back to our interview with Joni Mitchell. She has two new compilations, Dreamland and The Beginning of Survival. When we left off, we were comparing her 1967 and 2000 versions of her classic song, Both Sides Now. It always struck me that Both Sides Now is the kind of song about, you know, growing older and wiser and therefore seeing things a little differently. Um, and, of course, you wrote the song when you were really pretty darn young. <laughs> and the 2000 well, version yeah. of it is when you really are older and wiser. And you're looking and you're, you're singing that song that you wrote, you know, years ago when you were so much younger. And I, I was wondering if the song meant something different to you when you recorded it in 2000 than when you first recorded it. Well, um... I wrote the song when I was 21, um, and, and I didn't feel that it was a, a, a successful version. I, I was the interesting thing was that the, the astrological influence, the main thrust on my daughter was that she has to come to grips with fantasy and reality. It just has to do with the time that she was born. And the early work that I did right after her birth was... Um, almost like I was raising her because be, because the meditations that I was doing at 21 were on fantasy and reality, which is my daughter's thing to learn here in this life. Um, that whole song was a meditation on fantasy and reality. It begins with each verse has a very naive beginning verse, and then uh, the second half of the verse is coming to grips with reality. So each part has a kind of a fantasy half and a, a and a real half. Years went by, and I heard Mabel Mercer sing it in a small piano bar in New York. She was then in her 70s, and I would be about 24, I guess. And I went backstage to see her afterwards because she did a magnificent job of it. She She is a chansonnier, so she spoke her way through it, but she brought the drama of the text so to life. And I went back and said, uh, you know, Miss Mercer, that's the best performance of that song I've ever heard. You know, it needs to be done by an older person. Well, she <laughs> she was really offended. I didn't tell her I was the author or anything, you know. Like, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought what I learned was, oh, you know, a woman is never old. Even in a woman in her 70s doesn't want to hear, you know, like an, an older woman like you, especially from a 20-year-old girl. So... But but it took a long time. I, uh, theatrically speaking, it was, you know, it, in, it, it was just odd, I think, to be singing that song when I was so young. And the meditation was so big, it seemed like I hardly scratched the surface of it. So I never felt it was really successful. Now, the liner notes of your new compilations feature paintings that you've done. The covers of both of the compilations feature self-portraits that you've done. Because for years you've painted as well as as written songs and, 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 and performing. Um, and I, I'm wondering if, if, if it's difficult for you to do self-portraits. I mean, if, I don't know if you think of yourself as a self-conscious person. Um, you know, there's so, much, there's so much reflecting on yourself and staring on your, at yourself that you must have to do to do a good self-portrait. No, it, uh, a self-portrait is, is like a portrait of, uh, like any portrait, really. It's very exacting relative to landscapes where you have a little bit of poetic license. So, you know, I'll, I'll work for a while on landscapes. And uh, the only reason I started doing self-portraits is because I wanted to do my own album art and the record company insists that you stick your kisser on the cover, right? You know, otherwise I would I would choose something else. But the, somewhere the, the company believes that, and th that records sell more if the artist's picture is on the cover. So, but, but the, there's no real difference between a self-portrait and a portrait of anybody else, except that if you, people don't understand portraiture. I mean, I might accept in a painting of myself something that I wouldn't necessarily accept in a publicity photo. In a publicity photo, you want to look nice. In a painting, you, you want to capture an emotion, and it doesn't matter whether you look nice or not. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It has to have, a painting is very different from a photograph. So, and any portrait is like a pool game. It's a series of little abstract angles. And you either you get the angles right or you get them wrong, you know, um, whether it's a self-portrait or a portrait of somebody else. Sometimes in a self-portrait, you know, the, the source material that I'm looking at is more attractive than what I end up with. 
if I did that to somebody else, they'd probably get ticked off. I can do that to myself. I can stop the painting, even though it may not be as flattering as, as you know, at the moment where it's it's putting out, it's conveying something, some kind of an emotion, you know. Joni Mitchell will be back in the second half of the show. She has two new CD collections. Dreamland is a career retrospective. The beginning of survival collects songs from the 80s and 90s. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. I think I'm falling in love again When I get that crazy feeling I know I'm in trouble again I'm in trouble Cause you're a rambler and a gambler And a sweet-talking ladies' man Coming up, more of our conversation with Joni Mitchell. She has two new CD compilations. This song is on Dreamland. Driving into town with the dark cloud above you Dialing the number who's bound to love you Oh honey, you turn me on I'm a radio, I'm a country station I'm a little bit corny, I'm a wild Broadcasting tower waiting for you And I'm sending you this signal here I hope you can pick it up loud and clear I know you don't like weak women You get bored so quick And you don't like strong women Cause they're hip to your tricks It's been dirty for dirty Down the line but you know when you whistle when you're loving and kind If you've got too many doubts If there's no good reception for me Then tune me out Cause honey, who needs the static It hurts the head And you wind up cracking in the day. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross, back with Joni Mitchell. She hasn't been writing, recording, or performing for the past few years, but she's reviewing her body of work and putting together compilations. Two of them were recently released. Dreamland is a career retrospective that includes some of her classics like Circle Game and Big Yellow Taxi. The Beginning of Survival collects songs from the 80s and 90s, which she considers to represent some of her strongest work. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing about the music you, you grew up with. I, I understand your father played trumpet. Was was he in a marching band? Do, do I have Do I have that right? Yes, the, the, there was a North Battleford, Saskatchewan had a Kinsman band, and um, briefly my father led it for one year. But he was he was a trumpet player in it. So, um, did you like those those old marches? I mean, I I really I really actually do. <laughs> um, well, I love pageantry, uh-huh, you know, and uh-huh. a, even small town pageantry. It was great, you know. All the streamers and your friends were in the parades, and be, were and you the in the parades? Sometimes I'd be on floats as a kid, you know. Yeah, and and uh, you know, it was a small town, um, and there was a lot of that kind of goofy drag, you know, like bearded drag in in in, in the parades too for comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, they were fun. Uh, would you describe the town you grew up in? Well, I grew up in a lot of towns. I I was born in Fort McLeod, Alberta, which is where the prairie um, begins to roll, and in the distance there are the mountains, and that's where all the flyboys internationally were congregated to getting ready to go to the war, my father among them, but he was grounded because he was colorblind, so he was a, a teaching there as opposed to going off to war. Um then we moved to Calgary, Alberta, which, uh, again, is a foothill town. Then we moved, after the war was over, to a small hamlet, Maidstone, Saskatchewan, population 400, no no indoor plumbing, no running water, um, no water tower. Um, then and, and that was a good experience. That gave me a third-world experience. Our water was delivered on horse-drawn wagons, uh, flatbeds. My grandfather was one of the first white men out there. So my mother, I was only three generations from... Oh, I see. So it was like the frontier. Yes. Okay. Okay. I've spoken to many artists over the years who 
during their developmental de- developmental years as a child or in their early teens, had some kind of like severe in- injury or illness that basically sidelined them from the kind of lives the other children were leading, and they stayed home and they either read or painted or listened to music because they couldn't go out and do anything else. I know you had polio. Well, first of all, you don't have polio. Polio is a disease that strikes the central nervous system, like, um, and, and the duration of, of the disease, is, infectiously speaking, is two weeks. During that time, you're highly infectious and you have to be hospitalized. So I was the only case in my region. They flew me out of town into a, a um, kind of a, a leper colony, um, uh, a series of trailers hooked together since it was so infectious. And there I remained for quite a while um, and did therapy, which was they applied scalding rags on your body and so on and sent in therapists. But it, you... Polio eats the wires that animate your muscles. So even though the disease only lasts two weeks, you're pretty much left with the ravages for the rest of your life. Like, a, I forget what year it was, but Neil Young had to have a metal rod put up his back. The strong part of his back was overtaking the weak back, you know, um, part of his back, and, and it had to be reinforced by metal. I lucked out and met a Chinese healer who actually animated a couple of the down wires and, and you know... My back is is pulling fairly evenly, but that's would be considered miraculous by some. Do you, Do you think that your career as a performer has been affected um, by by the lingering effects of the polio? You know, life on the ro- road is uh, difficult for for anybody, but um, particularly if your body is as at all weakened or compromised, yes, it, it must be very hard. In my forties, the the extension over an acoustic guitar of my right shoulder. Uh, began to become very painful it, it, in conjunction with the damage in my back and that that distortion. I went to a thinner guitar. I went to an electric guitar and a very light one at that to take the pressure off of my back, and that that helped considerably. But but it's painful to play acoustic guitar. Um, a nice little thin electric is is better. That's another reason for that shift, which. You know, some people lament, "Oh, go play acoustic." Well, you, you know, go go sit on a tack. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like you know, no, it's too painful. You know, <laughs> no, it's, and, it's, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And also, when you're traveling, you're carrying heavy bags on you. You're you're kind of laid, laden down like a donkey, and and the cockeyedness of my back also created an an inequality in my two feet. So I developed a tumor benign in my right foot. So. Standing high heels are certain things that are kind of attractive for show business. I can't wear. Um, yeah, they're, the polio um, has to be worked around, but I've never seen it as a problem per se. My guest is Joni Mitchell. She has two new compilations, Dreamland and The Beginning of Survival. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. This flame, you put her in this Eskimo hole. In this hitcher, in this prisoner of the fine white lines, of the white lines on the free, free way. My guest is Joni Mitchell. She has two new compilations, Dreamland and The Beginning of Survival. I, I want to read a quote to you from um, an early newspaper article about you, and this is when you were uh, married to your first husband, and, and he said, Joni and I have developed our act. We're not just folk singers now. We do comedy, sing some ragtime, and do folk rock. We're ready for the big clubs now. <laughs> this, uh-huh. is, this is very early in your career. And it's so interesting for me to read that because it's about like polishing your act. And I mean, you were such the kind of like prototype singer-songwriter before the whole singer-songwriter um, 
before singer-songwriters had really caught on. I mean, you, you know, you're helping to kind of create this phenomenon. And, and so right before that, you know, you and your husband are preparing to, like, have an act. On, um, you know, where you do some comedy, some ragtime, some folk rock. Can well, you? Then, well, no, 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 wait a minute. Yeah. Did I say that or did no, he, he say that? No, he said that. He said, was he misrepresenting? He said that. Was Abs- he misrepresenting it? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, well, first of all, I didn't want to be in a duo with him. He forced me to be. Oh. Um, <laughs> you, you know, secondly, the comic emerged because he had forced me to, you know, I had to be on stage with a lot of stuff that I couldn't relate to. So, you know, I, I was a bit of a punk. I just think of me as kind of a little. little uh, Johnny Rotten a little bit, but but things hadn't gotten quite so wild. But the spirit when I met Johnny, I thought you know, I feel very kindred to him. And we're 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 similar kind of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but anyway. So how could I tolerate this act? Um, I had to send it up. Like we we would do Flanders and Swan. Not that I don't like Flanders and Swan. I just didn't want to do Flanders and Swan. You know, I didn't see myself as doing that, you know, and I'd stick a pillow in my dress. I played kazoo. I did a lot of things that were very satirical, you know, to, you know, to keep myself from just thinking, oh, brother, oh, brother, oh, brother, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was yeah. like, so the comedy evolved really kind of in a reactionary way out of me, not that, you know, and, and I don't even think he got that I was being sarcastic. At what point did you realize that you would start performing songs that you wrote and that you you would you would be, you know, the best interpreter of your own songs? I mean, I'll say the first time I heard your name mentioned was um when Judy Collins was performing at Brooklyn College. It was sometime in the I don't know mid or mid late 60s, 67 maybe, 66, I can't remember. And um and she said there's this wonderful songwriter, you know, um, named Joni Mitchell, and I'm going to do one of her songs. And I think I think she did Clouds. And um, you know, for, first I heard of you, <laughs> and I think that was true for a lot of people that they have probably first heard you through other people performing you. Mm-hmm. Here's how it evolved. Uh, it, 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 I started singing um, folk music for fun in art school, and and I could pick up some money, which gave me money to smoke, and it gave me money to to bowl and it gave me money to go to movies. I was on such a tight budget. So by by singing folk songs, I could, you know, make this money. I, that was the extent of my ambition, you know. It was just something that I did for fun while I was studying to be a painter. And then when I traveled to other places, there would be resident folk singers and, and the folk community was, was extremely narrow-minded and tyrannical and very political but in a, in, in a kind of a irritated way. You know, it wasn't an attractive colony to me. I just thought, you're too, you know, you don't know how to party. <laughs> you know, yeah. like you don't, loosen up, you don't know how to party. So, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have any sense of, the world had not opened up to me yet. You have to understand, I was just a good time Charlie from Saskatoon that wanted to paint, you know, and that's, and I sang these songs for fun. But everywhere that I went, you'd get into you'd, you'd find these very political creatures who would say, "So and so owns that song on this territory, and you can't sing it." But and you'd go into a new place, and by God, they'd strip your repertoire back down to nothing. It was hard to get a good song. Everybody seemed to own these songs, and they get quite nasty about it. So, you could say that part of coming to write came out of the necessity. Otherwise, you get you you'd come into a town and you'd, you'd be told you can't sing that, you can't sing that, you can't sing that, and half your good stuff would be eliminated. Crow in the Cradle was one I can recall. Oh, you can't sing that, and that was one of my my best songs. It was a it was an anti-war song. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it was one of my favorites. Then when I got to Toronto, you couldn't sing it. That was so and so's song, and that was so and so's song, and Everybody had the territory nailed down, you know, as for known written songs within the context of regions. In the late 60s, when your music started catching on, did you have, um, um, did you feel that there were stereotypes of what a woman on stage was supposed to look like or behave like? And how did you feel compared to what the images you were used to were, you know, did 
Well, I came up on uh, on uh, you know women in evening gowns with with gentle ladylike manners in terms of the image of the way singers were presented. Right. When I when I got into the coffee houses, there were a lot of shaggy armpit girls, <laughs> you know, like didn't shave their legs or their you know, and had very strong, to me at the time, silly political convictions. Uh, and, and I was intuitively correct, even though I was not very well educated, as it turns out, you, you know, most of their heroes were CIA plants and everything, you know, so I had a pretty good antenna for for crapola even back then. But there was this stark, serious, uh, communist kind of way of dressing in the coffee houses, and I made my own clothes, and they were pretty flamboyant. They were like... Um, you know, chartreuse lace. They were, they were more beetleish or something. I don't. I don't know where it was coming from. It was just, you know, I'd buy old pieces of cloth and and old belt buckles and make these dresses. So I I dressed very um, oddly in the context of the coffee houses. Um, I never really. Uh, I never was a joiner, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't really belong to a political perspective or to you know. I'm a. Com- I'm. I'm interested in comparative religions, and I like a little bit of all of them. It can't swallow, you know, the the, the politics. The, the churches all get too far away from their prophets. The prophets would all be pretty much in agreement. So I'm interested in the prophets of all religions. They all make sense to me, but the religions don't, right? So, I mean. Yeah, I'm So so you didn't you didn't need a role model. <laughs> you no. Just, you just were who you were. Uh, no, um it it seems to me like uh, you know a lot of your songs are not the kind of 32 bar form, you know, the kind of standard song form A A B A and um how did you when you started writing writing songs, were you intentionally like violating standard song form or were you just like write, writing what was in your head not thinking of what standard song form was, just doing what came to you? The first piece of music, the piece of music that probably made a musician out of me was a piece of music by Rachmaninoff called Variations on a Theme by Paganini. Why he bothered to tip his hand to Paganini, I don't know, because Paganini's piece was really fast. Rachmaninoff played it backwards and slowed it down considerably, and it's a very romantic, beautiful ballad. Um, I had to hear that piece of music again and again. Edith Piaf also gave me goosebumps. This is pre-teener stuff. Debussy, Beethoven. As a pre-teener, I was mostly a classical. I loved classical music. And my playmates were all little baby classical students. Sharon Bell, Frankie McKittrick, you know, these people were all studying and were, and were quite excellent. Wonderkind, or, you know what I mean? They, mm-hmm. Uh, and I I accompanied them to adjudicated performances. So I was hanging out with ba- little baby uh, classical music prodigies on a small town level. So do you think that maybe your songs came out differently than the standard song form because you'd listen to classical music more than popular song? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I went from Rachmaninoff and Debussy to Louis Jordan at about 11. Uh, you know, then rock and roll came along. And then I I danced frantically. I, I put an extra dance on a week, you know, just because I couldn't make it through the school week without an extra dance. Wednesday night dances for a while. I I instigated an extra one for the joy of that. And that's that's a mindless physical, you know. That that's all about the beat, and you know, you're not even listening to the words at that point. Uh, early in the interview, we t- talked about how you're taking a, a curatorial role toward your work, you're, you're, you're looking at your body of work and, and co-producing new compilations and putting them, you know, repackaging the songs differently and going through them and taking stock of the music that you've written. And I'm wondering if we, if we might end with a song that you have, um, that you hear differently than you did when you wrote it, a song that seems, um, that you hear something you didn't hear before or that you like more than you did when you wrote it or, you know, that you've reevaluated in some way. Gee, well, I've had, you know, ask, it's so unstable at any moment, any one of them. Like, I like it, I don't like it. You know, it's like, um, I'll, I'll tell you this, that, that the you know, at the 
the the Geffen record, the the beginning of Survival, mm -hmm. everything on there is fairly stable to to me. You know, I I really you can play. It's not a matter of reevaluation. All of that material w was buried in the basement. Nobody knew it was there. Uh, for 20 years, it was repressed. It, it, it was not on the shelves of any store. Uh, I had to fight uh, personally without management, without lawyers, to get it resurrected. You know, um, I'm very proud to say that the fight was enjoyable, and I love the men in the basement <laughs> that I worked with. You know, they're scared of it because everybody's scared of their job. So they're scared of the people above them, and I'm saying, sick me on somebody. I'm not scared of anybody. Is but anyway, I, I got this stuff out of the basement and back on the shelves, and you can play anything off of the beginning of Survival. I'm very proud of this album. I think it's my best work. It's my my I thought deep and hard and tried to be... Gen you know, fair, not generous, but f fair and smart and soulful. And, you know, I think a lot of things come together. People might say, oh, listen to the drum machines on there. But that enabled me to do the rhythmic composition. And, uh, you know, whatever the prejudices are against this music, um, I would like to, before I can write again, I need people to give it a fair shake because I'm sick of people saying, there's nothing here, this is no good. Uh, you know, it, it's taken too much of a bad rap, and I'm very proud of it. Do you want to choose a song? Anything off of there. Okay. Good enough. <laughs> then we'll choose one. Well, Joni Mitchell, it's really been great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Joni Mitchell has two new anthologies, a career retrospective called Dreamland and a collection of songs from the 80s and 90s called The Beginning of Survival, which includes this song, Slouching Toward Bethlehem. <laughs> Turning and turning Within the widening gyre The falcon cannot hear The falconer Things fall apart The center cannot hold And a blood-dimmed upon the world Nothing is sacred The ceremony sings Innocence is drowned In anarchy The best black conviction Given some time This is Fresh Air. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Naomi Person, Monique Nazareth, Henry Boldonado, Patty Leswing, Ian Chillog, and Joan Tui Westman. I'm Terry Gross. <laughs>